You know, you better hide some of this stuff. These guys like to take it back and use it for their next <coughs> time. Dick, tell her food is what we're after. <laughs> food is what he's after. Great farmer. Damn, I tell you, too many more of us old people get together. I we're having a bench in the I got so much film, so much tape. All right. How are you? Oh, it was lovely. <laughs> and I, I made a pact with myself that I was going to get me a job when I got to be 85. 85. 85. Yeah. And I mentioned that. You're working on that. I'm working on that. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah, real nice. Because I asked you the same thing. I said, it's the first time I've ever been in one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, me too. They have one in Myrtle Beach. Yeah. I'm going to have to send out for extra makeup for me and Steve. Oh, yeah. If they got a lot. Some, if they got some color back, I swear that would be my I think so too. With the rouge. She looks so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do about uh, Beatty there on top? My God, I mean. she can't do much about me. Yeah. Red, you got enough stuff? Y'all been ripping like me? Just put that bombing fluid on me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Judy, you look beautiful. I've heard it. <laughs> You're not proposing, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not proposing at all. <laughs> There's one. Yeah, oh no, Red Farmer's here. I can't believe it. Did you get him out of nursing home or what? <laughs> You're right there. Hey. Did they get you out of nursing home or what? What are you doing, Doc? Well, I, wait, wait, see, I figured I said, well, I knew Bobby would be the last one here. Did you get, did they get you out of nursing home or what? <laughs> I we had to go. I told everybody an hour ago, I said, the last person walking that door is going to be Bobby Allison. Well, he, I said, when he dies, they're going to have to hold the funeral up 30 minutes for him well, to I get there. Because he's going to be guy, late. The <laughs> guy out there thought I was somebody and got my autograph. <laughs> <laughs> the only way you can tell Red flying is his lips are moving. <laughs> well, Stroke, you know, that guy, that we got to tell some stories on TV in here now. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we can tell, so we can't. Tell him, tell us something. You got one more. Or is this for the auction or something? Yes, yeah, so you each going to get one. <coughs> That's, That's pretty special to me. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Big names here. Yeah. Me, Barney. That's right. <laughs> Legend in your own mind, huh? <laughs> Are y'all taping? Yeah. Am I at the right place? Am I right place? Well, that's the thing, see, all these people get together, these are the people you tell the stories on. So it's, that could be a real problem. You may want to choose sides here. This group's going to tell stories on this group while this group tells stories on that group. That'd probably work out pretty well. The problem I've always had with stories is when you tell them your way, there's always the other guy that's there that disagrees with the way you told it. Kale and I had some interesting, we told a story one time and it, his version was totally different than my version. Same story, but uh, he saw it totally different than I did. Well, who is that? We never, we never did decide. Mm -hmm. We didn't have film. So you couldn't look at it's it. It's not like it is now where you can go back and look at the tape. Then it was just, who could tell the story the best. <laughs> and every race driver I've ever met is a pretty good storyteller. They learned that in self-defense. I think, I look okay? Yeah, I think I look pretty good. I think my wife would be proud. My children, mom and dad, Michael, my brother. I think everybody, I don't think I look real good. You're ready. I think compared to the other guys. <laughs> Here we go now. Yeah. Welcome to that fast car cafe in Nashville, Tennessee. What would happen if you put together the guys that built the cars with the guys that drove the cars with the inspector that tore down the cars with the writers that wrote about it and the announcers that announced it? You're about to go behind the scenes and hear the stories directly from the legends that lived them. 
these are the guys that made racing what it is today. Let's walk through the tunnel and join 24 stock car racing legends. Hey, hey, I heard y'all had to drive this thing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I got here. It's a long, man, it's a long way from Frank. <laughs> you were the series director when, when Doyle, it was, I guess it was Harold, had all that makeup on him, do you remember? Was that, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, we were at uh, <clears throat> Daytona, no, Talladega. And ABC or CBS was doing the race, and they had a makeup girl there, pretty girl. And the guy asked me, can we make up my late buddy Harold Kinder and Doyle in the flag stand? He went and told them we're going to take your picture during the race. They said, yeah, that'd be great. So they made them up, look as bad as all of us, <laughs> except they used lipstick, blacked their eyes, eyebrows, and that day it must have been 140 degrees in that flag stand. When it was over, they come down and all that old makeup had run down their face. <laughs> they looked terrible. That was, that was a good one. I, I never did tell Harold, but I, I told Doyle later oh, on. A good one. I was afraid Harold would kill me. You know, <laughs> sitting here in Nashville, I, I, I was trying to figure out exactly where we were going to start and kind of seed the conversation. And one thing I loved about the Nashville racetrack is that you always knew who won the races. Bobby, wasn't that right? There was never any dispute at the end of the races Hardly as to who won ever. a race? <laughs> Hardly ever. All right, now who won that day? Was it you or Kale? Well, no, they gave Kale the win. Yeah. And, and he well, still well, has they it. they didn't give it to me, I won it. <laughs> <laughs> um, they gave you know, um, a lot of strange things went on, but old, uh, the Gasway brothers, now Bill ran things, and Bill really was totally expressionless. You couldn't tell whether he liked what you did or didn't like what you did. But Joe, if he was mad, you could tell it from 200 feet away, and if he was happy, you could tell it from 300 feet away. And so uh, it was one of those situations where uh, old Joe, you know, he, he really jumped in there. And probably the, the best way I can position Joe, you know, he did whatever he thought he needed to do. Marty Robbins wanted to go racing, and, and I had a Dodge, and so we painted it up for Marty, and he took it to, we took it to Talladega for him. And um, Marty wanted to pass Richard Petty. He just wanted to pass Richard Petty really bad. So I fixed the carburetor so the rings fell out of it. So Marty went out there and he passed Richard Petty. And he came in, he told Joe Gasway, he said, I'm cheating, I want to be put all the way to the end of the line. So uh, he thought he was doing all the right things, you know, and go to the end of the line. He didn't know how many of those other guys had rings that fell out and were out there still racing. <laughs> but anyway, Joe Gasway got really mad. Well, well, I had fixed the carburetor, but he knew right then he couldn't do anything directly to me, so he fined my brother Eddie $1,000 and took his NASCAR license away. So, you know, those kind of things went on. Well, I had a little trouble with Joe Gasway here, too. So, um, one night, uh, I finished second here to a guy, and I was sitting there at the uh, gas pump. You know, in those days, we went to the gas pump to the scale, and then the winner went to Victory Lane, and the next four went to their truck. So I was sitting at the gas pump, and the guy that won got out of his car, and he, hey, Joe Gasway, come here. Joe Gasway, come here. So Joe came walking over there. You know, I got out of my car. What's this all about? I said, Joe. Bobby's got left side tires on the right. Old Joe says, I'm going to fine you a thousand dollars a tire. So I said, wow, Joe, he's got them on the right right there too. Old Joe turns around and he says, we ain't looking at him. We're looking at you. <laughs> and, and that guy went to victory lane with right side tires, on, with left side tires on the right. And I paid a $2,000 fine. <laughs> you had a deal here, didn't you? Two other, 84? I'm you and Neil? I'm not real comfortable with him and these other guys <laughs> sitting behind me. I really am not. Hey, Daryl, they said it's just like old time? Yeah. I said, look who's behind me. <laughs> <laughs> you think he set it up this way? And you know what he said? Uh -uh. He said, don't worry, he can't spin you out. I said, you don't know Caleb. That's right. He can turn you over. 
No, I, anything that Bobby says, I refer to Junior because I was just the driver. Mm -hmm. So whatever happened to those cars and all those things, there's a man over there that- <laughs> Junior didn't call Joe Gasway. <laughs> I'll tell you a Joe Gasway story though, since we're telling Joe Gasway stories. We're at Talladega and at the time you had to have two windshield braces in your windshield. Well, they changed the rule to where you had to have three windshield braces in your windshield to hold the windshield in. So we're getting, uh, we're Talladega, we're getting ready to practice. Joe comes down and says, you're not going on the track till you put that third windshield brace in there. I said, Joe, just let us practice, we'll fix it later. No way, you're not going on the track. So I said, all right. So I went to the toolbox, got me a roll of black tape, crawled inside the car and I put me a piece of black tape on the windshield and I went and got Joe and I said, now are you happy now? Go on out. <laughs> <laughs> so that fixed that. There you go. But I think Junior probably can tell you the best Nashville story or one of the best ones when me and Neil, <laughs> me and Neil <laughs> fought who was going to get in victory circle. <laughs> and Beatty could get in on that too. Yeah, Neil he was, won the race and there I got do what? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, they, they had a mix-up, a caution flag came out, and they did really flag Neil, the winner of the race, and here I am over in the truck with, <laughs> I guess, Beatty and Gasway and all of them, yeah. trying to get the things straightened out because I'd run first and second with the two cars with them, and uh, it didn't really bother me which one I'm willing <laughs> for <a second. laughs> What I felt like I was going to leave out there, and one of us wasn't going to want to drive no more. So. Uh, but Daryl really won the race. They just got the thing mixed up for a lap or two, and Neil was flagged the winner of it. But Neil understand, and he was in the winner's circle. Of course, I went to the winner's circle with him. I told him, I said, Neil, I think we got the wrong driver. And he says, what do you mean? He said, didn't I win this thing? So I said, no, I don't think you did. <laughs> But he got the trophy and got to kiss the girls and Darrell, he squawked and carried on for about an hour. They finally gave him the race and we went on. I got the, I didn't, I already had a guitar, so I didn't care. <laughs> you know, I think one of, one of my memories of coming to Nashville is uh, when it was high bank. What was it, what was it bank? 35 degrees. 35 degrees, 35 I don't know, some, some tremendous amount. But anyway, I just started driving from Herman Bean. And you know, Herman was the guy that, when the race started, the turtle, and he just rode all, all day, but had good equipment, had pretty good, pretty good cars. And so he gave me a chance to start driving for him. And, and we came up here, and I had never been to, to Nashville before, and boy, those banks were straight up, you know, and awesome looking place. And I won't ever forget, that there was a, a billboard down in one of the turns with a big old clown, with a big clown had a big old mouth grinning and uh, and the race got started, and Buck Baker and somebody, Buddy's daddy, Buck Baker, and somebody tangled up, and Tiny Lund, I think, all tangled up, and Buck's car went through that clown's mouth. I won't ever forget that the billboard. I mean, just right, just out of the racetrack in, in, uh, through, through, through the billboard. But the funny part about it is I slowed down, and Tiny Lund's car caught on fire, and he jumped out of the car, you know, Tiny weighed, what? 350 pounds or whatever, and six foot, foot eight or what it was, but he came down that 35 degree bank. He couldn't stop, but he came down there and ran into the side of Herman's car and bent the door in, my car that I was driving, and bent the door in on that thing. <laughs> and I'm telling you, when the race was over, Herman was so mad he couldn't all couldn't understand it because Tiny had run into the side of his car <laughs> on his feet and bent, bent the door in. <laughs> did, you, did your daddy get any kind of a prize for that accuracy right through the uh, clown's face? No, I don't think so, but uh, <laughs> what was the guy that was the harbor pilot that, uh, that we raced against in Columbia and Savannah and all? Oh, yeah. Anyway, the guy weighed, I'm telling this on Bud Moore because I... Bud was, we were running, we were running in Savannah and, and uh, Bud and this guy were having a terrible battle and somehow Bud knocked him into the wall. Well, he went down there to see if he was all right. Well, the guy was really mean and he, I come by there and I saw Bud had his arms around his leg like he was dragging him out of the car and I said, are you, have you lost your mind? That guy will kill you. And he said, I ain't trying to drag him out, I'm holding him in. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's trying to 
get out that car to get at me, man. I just hold him tight as I could. <laughs> Everybody was cheering. You know how I remember how we used to get in trouble? They'd all hang through the fence on the front straightaway and scream at you and holler and pull guns and knives. <laughs> and they, I said, man, if I ever get out of here alive, you know, I'll be lucky. But they, Kale was talking about them bank track in Nashville. First time I ever come up here and seen this place, I, I know where you're coming from because they introduced me to all the, the previous champions and people that won all their divisions and they were all in wheelchairs. I ain't lying to you. <laughs> I wish Bud had time to tell some of his Ned Jarrett uh, stories. I ain't Jarrett saying stories. one of them. <laughs> Not we went one. To, we went to a thing one night, they were honoring Ned and they asked little Bud to get up because they were teammates at one time and I never heard so many funny stories about Ned Jarrett. Yeah. I mean, Bud could fill you in. Little Bud could fill you in. Yeah, Go for it. No, man, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. He, had, a, he right. had four pages of things on Ned. <laughs> they signed a truce. They're not, oh, they're not going to do that anymore? <laughs> no, I think he quit drinking since then. Uh, Is that what it was? <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? He said you quit drinking. <laughs> I did. I got about half loaded, you know, and I was the, I was the, um, I was the, the guest. Nobody knew I was a guest. Remember, I wasn't on the thing at the last minute. I got up there, you know, and like nobody didn't even know who I was. And I had me old pair of shades on, something I turned around. And I just told them I thought this thing was going to go good looking out at the audience because everybody out there looked as redneck as I did, you know, and that's how we got it cranked up. But really didn't have to tell many stories on, on Ned. It was just talking about Bondi and them because yeah. Ned was with them, you know, and it just kind of suckered Ned into the deal. I mean, he really deserved it. It was the... hard on his image, I can tell you that. <laughs> things I'd never heard before. I worked for 60 years to try to build that's a good image. <laughs> 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 <But you, laughs> I love your story. Oh, man, we were just talking about one a minute ago, but we can't tell you, you know. <laughs> We'd like to. We'd like to be able hey, to. Brad, watch it. <laughs> Let's talk about some of those folks that used to be with us, that used to do some running. How about Tiny Lund? Now, there was a guy everybody's got stories about. Baker, Tiny Lund. Mm, mm. Right here in this right. very town. <laughs> you guys remember when we had the uh, cheetah as the mascot for the Charlotte Motor Speedway? Well... They started taking that thing around the area and to each racetrack, and they had this big old cheetah. And he's real friendly, somewhat. Till you, till, <laughs> till you, till you, well, till you turned your back, and he'd knock the seat out of your britches in about two seconds. And for some reason, Tiny thought it would be clever to uh, put this cat in my bedroom and uh, leave it. <laughs> so I come in, I'd been out with the racing group and uh, we got in kind of late and I didn't even worry about turning the lights on. Got my clothes off, pulled the sheet up to my ear like that and I heard this. <laughs> <laughs> what? No. <laughs> so I just clicked the light on and this cat was directly in my face. <laughs> well, with that, I removed the door <laughs> to the hallway on my hands and knees. I never even stood up. I just run head on into the door, <laughs> crashed my head in, got the door. Down the hall I went, and everybody was running because I was running, and I thought they were running because the cat was after me. <laughs> so I went to the length of the hall, and of course, there's Tiny up there with a the big cat laughing himself to death and me in my birthday suit at the far end of the... That was embarrassing enough, just that, but uh, putting that cat in my room in the middle of the night like that, that was Tiny Lund special. You know something about it. Does anybody about remember an alligator story? Oh, wait oh, up. Oh, I can oh, tell the that. alligator story. There you go. Buddy and I were at uh, Santee Cooper. Tiny owned a fish camp down on Santee Cooper Reservoir. Buddy got, and I had gone down there to fish with him one August, fish for school and strivers. And there's a little canal led out from Tiny's camp out to the main uh, body of water, which is Lake Moultrie. And we were going, uh, motoring out real easily, uh, real slowly to the big lake. And Buddy looked around and said, my, my goodness, there's, there's an alligator there on the bank. So I didn't know there were alligators at Santee Cooper. There was a little alligator about two feet long, two or three feet long. And Tiny knew immediately he had something going with Baker, who was afraid of any creature that doesn't have any shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> so Tiny said, Buddy, there are man-eaters 
in Santee Cooper. And Buddy shuddered, you know, he got cold chill. We went on out there and we'd had a, a few beverages that was so hot and everything. So the day wore on, yeah. waiting for the fish to hit. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Buddy started complaining about the heat and humidity and Tiny said, well, strip down your skivvies and jump in, take a swim, cool off. Well, Buddy apparently had forgotten about the alligator, the man-eating alligator in Lake Moultrie, which was a lie, of course. And uh, so he slips it, uh, over the side of the boat to take a dip. Well, I turned around to say to Tiny, I can't believe he got in that water. And Tiny was gone. He wasn't there. <laughs> so Buddy comes up, shakes his head. Man, this is refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> Under he goes. He comes back up, throw me a line. <laughs> Under he goes. About that time, Tiny couldn't hold his breath any longer, and he surfaced and came up, and I said, uh, Buddy, why didn't you just swim to the boat? He said, when you think an alligator's got your manhood, you go where the alligator wants. <laughs> I can still and hear Buddy it. Buddy says I didn't tell the rest of the story. I never have, but I'll let Buddy tell the rest well, of the I story. Well, I can tell you, anybody that knows Tiny knows that he really had a great time with people in <clears throat> As he grabbed me, where you're not supposed to grab people, uh, <laughs> the first thing was not on alligators. I thought one had me, but I was really concerned about everything else. And <laughs> under all this, I'm trying to keep up with whatever has me, and I hear this. <laughs> <laughs> but I left him out there for a while. I got to the boat paddle before he could get back in the boat, and I made him really appreciate that getting back into that boat, because every time he come up, I'd... I thought Buddy was going to decapitate him when he was swinging the boat paddle like that. And finally, I told him, I said, my God, Buddy, you, they'll charge you with manslaughter if he drowns because he can't tread water any longer. <laughs> he finally let him back in the boat. I'm sure most, some, most of you know the story about Tiny and I years ago in Atlanta, but I'm, I'm going to tell it again. Tiny was a mountain of a man, you know, just tremendous man and strong as a bull and and it was in, in our early days of racing, and uh, Tiny and I were staying at the same motel in Atlanta. Got home that afternoon, we went, into, w went to the pool and got in the pool, and, and uh, Tiny would just put his hand on you, you know, and you'd, you'd go down. Well, he almost drowned me. I, I couldn't touch the bottom. He'd stand on the bottom. <laughs> he was just having fun, you know, and he was bobbing me around like a, like, like a baby, you know. And, uh, and, and, so I finally said, Tiny, I said, you about to drown. I got to get some air, man. Oh, you know, he just <laughs> pushed you back down. And uh, anyway, finally got out of the pool and, uh, and, and went to our rooms. And uh, Tiny was in the shower, taking a shower. And I got me a trash can and filled it up with water and ice. Got it good and cold. I said, I'm going to get him back. So I walked, I sneaked in there and I walked, got up on top of the, the uh, tub there where I could really get the, thing over on Tiny and I poured that ice water on them and it, it almost scared him to death really with all that ice water hitting him. But anyway he came out of the shower in his birthday suit. I went out the door and he came out the door. It was still daylight. And right behind me through the parking lot we went. <laughs> <laughs> and I ran to the car and the, the, the uh, deck lid was up and I ran and turned around, the car, around that car and there was a little old lady there must have been 80 years old about four feet and a half tall and when I went by it startled her and when when she looked up Tiny come sliding right up to her you know just <laughs> just, just right just uh, in, in his birthday suit and all the time he says pardon me ma'am <laughs> <laughs> and turn, turn around and went back went back to the room but uh, he, he was he was always pulling something David you got one? I know one on Tiny well it's not on Tiny it really it's on me really? <laughs> we was racing up there at Hickory one time and uh, I was come up behind Tiny, and uh, in fact, I believe I was laughing him. I was leading a race at that time, and he wouldn't get over. And I kept a bumping and kept a bumping him, you know, and trying to get by him. And he stuck that old big arm out the window and shook his fist at me, you know. I said, well, now, if I don't hit him now, he's going to think I'm scared of him, you know. <laughs> so we went down to one. I hit him and spun him out, you know. So went on. I would have to win the race. And after the race, here he comes. Somebody gave him a cherry pie, and he was eating it, and he walked up to me. He said, look here. He said, why'd you spin me out? And I said, well, you know why I spun you out, you know. I said, if you hadn't stuck that fist out the window and shook it at me, I'd, I wouldn't have ever spun you out, you know. And uh, 
he said, well, that's all right. And he patted me on the shoulder and had that pie and said, bam! <laughs> <laughs> got that pie and just covered my face with that cherry pie. And I was standing there. I couldn't do nothing but laugh. You know, of course, I wasn't about to hit him no way. <laughs> but he really enjoyed that. He really did. That, that done him more good to hit me in the pie, face with that pie than it did to win a race. <laughs> you talk about Tiny. I remember a time up in Wisconsin it was that we was up there running a the race and Tiny was up there. And we was all sitting at the Holiday Inn. We went out to a restaurant to eat, and I think they had had a few cool ones between here and there. And Joe Frazon was there with Tiny Lund. And they were sitting each end of about a 20-man table, all of us sitting there having dinner, having a butter fight with the cubes of butter and the knives, flipping them back and forth. We ended up back at the Howard Johnson. And about uh, 11 o'clock at night, we got back to Howard Johnson. and. Uh, Joe and uh, Tiny decided they wanted to go swimming in the pool. They had an indoor swimming pool at the Howard Johnson. But uh, nobody had bathing suits. They said, well, that ain't going to stop them. They, everybody's already going to the rooms. It's closed now. So they opened the pool up, went in there. It was going to go skinny dipping. And I told them, I said, well, I don't, I, I got to go back to the room. I wasn't feeling too good anyway. They said, no, I went down to my room. <laughs> so there, about six of them out there skinny dipping at the Howard Johnson at midnight. So I went back to the room and about, oh, I was about sleeping. I heard a knock on the door real quietly. So I made a mistake. I walked up there and I opened up the door just to crack. And about that time, Joe Frazon and Tiny both sitting there and they're all together. And they grabbed me on each shoulder and down the hall I went with my toes dragging the ground and I went skinny dipping with them. And I didn't do it on purpose. But that's the way he was. He wanted to have fun. Everybody else was going to have fun. So they, had, they drug me down the hall and threw me in the pool about midnight. Now, if my calculation is correct, we've told five stories. We've got four nakeds and one in the skivvies. <laughs> <laughs> and all of them are usable. That's the good news. Is they're all usable. There's a racing story about Tiny. Back when NASCAR first uh, started the division with the Camaros and Mustang, it was Baby Grand. Well, I drove a car for Huggins, uh, which now, you know, a Huggins Tire Company. It was a Mustang, and Tiny drove a Mercury for Bud Moore. Well, I was fortunate. I was in a real good car and had pretty good luck. Tiny and I got in pretty good battle as far as wins and, and everything like that. Well, I'm on the pole, and he's outside pole at Bristol, Tennessee. And we're going around there, and Bristol, Tennessee, they had banked. You know, they were going to be the highest bank racetrack in the world or whatever it was anyway and so we're going down the straightaway and we're coming to get one lap to go and tiny runs in the side of me bam so i look over to him and he's laughing ha 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 like that well he runs into me again and i said what in the world is he doing so we go into the first second turn and he just normal i said well you know ain't nothing gonna happen and all of a sudden he comes right down next to me and spits water <laughs> in my car. Now, how I did this, and it got all over my goggles. <laughs> and, and here I am getting ready. I got to go through three and four now and start a race. And he is spit water all in my How he had that much water in his mouth. He may, he may have had a jug. I don't know. But anyway, so I'm coming down the back straightaway. And naturally, I'm trying to get my goggles cleaned off. And, you know, I got water all over my face. And, you know, we all had open face helmets at that time. And I go through three and four anyway. I, I end up, I win the race. After the race comes over, he, he's laughing. He said, man, he said, I got you wet, didn't I? And that's all he, he didn't say congratulations on the race. He said, man, I got you wet, didn't I? <laughs> I mean, that's the way he was. We're, we're at uh, Atlanta Motor Speedway, same way. Mile and a half racetrack. And we're going down the straightaway. And Smokey Unix Camaro was on the pole. And I was outside. And Tiny was third. And he's running into me. He didn't run into Smokey's car. He's running into me. And me starting on the outside. I said, what in the world is he trying to do? And that's just the way he was. He'd race you hard. Uh, he would run into you once in a while, but there ain't a guy sitting in here who wouldn't run into you. <laughs> if he said he would. The guys today don't have the same Ned kind of. Ned would not. No, Ned no. wouldn't have done it. Ned never the guys today don't have this kind of camaraderie and this kind of <laughs> these stories to tell, I don't think. <laughs> they don't but get Ned. to enjoy life like we did either. No, no. You want to say something, bud? <laughs> Ned, you hung out with a bad crowd, though, as I recall. What, didn't you and Ralph Earnhardt used to go to the races together, you and your two wives? Huh? Yep, sure did. How did that Ned work and his out? Two wives. No, I didn't <laughs> no, no, not his two wives. <laughs> Their two wives. Yeah. The group. Yeah, the two oh, Marthas. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. my math was... The, the two Marthas. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, Ralph's wife's name Martha, and my wife's name was Martha. And yeah, they were good friends, and we'd go to races <laughs> together a lot. 
Did uh, you come home together? Uh, uh, not every time, <laughs> no. Uh, if, you know, of course, we've all, most of you guys have raced against Dale, and I guess, well, of course, Junior raced against Ralph, and uh, he was a tough competitor. And Junior, I've always felt that, that if there was ever a chip off the old block, that Dale Earnhardt is a chip off the old block as far as his dad was concerned. It looked like Junior, Dale Junior, is about the same I way. I say chip but, number two. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and uh, uh, he would race you hard, knock you off the racetrack, and come up and put his arm around you, Ralph would, and say, oh, buddy, I didn't mean to get in that corner that hard. He said, I didn't mean to run you off the track. And uh, he'd, he'd butter up to you, you know. One night we were down at uh, Gaffney, South Carolina. It was a three quarter of a mile dirt track. And we was running these 37 Ford Coupes. This was in the sportsman division. And long straightaways and short turns, sort of like Martinsville. And uh, I was leading the race and he hit me going into turn one. And so hard that I just kept going. Of course, he didn't have any bank or guardrail or anything like that. It went off of a bank a little bit, and that thing started rolling. And uh, finally got back on its wheels and rolled down there and hit a pine tree and just totally demolished my race car. Of course, we only had one, and we raced it four or five times a week. And uh, my wife had planned a birthday party for Ralph the next night in a little restaurant in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Was gonna race at the Char old Charlotte Fairgrounds track on Friday night and then go over to Kannapolis to this restaurant and have that birthday party for Ralph. Well, Martha couldn't drive. She didn't drive back then. And uh, I had to take her to that thing. And she was the host. I wouldn't get out of that car and go in there and, and help him celebrate his birthday. No way in the world was I gonna help him celebrate a birthday. But, you know, the next week he was out there with his arm around, everything's okay. And, and you, could, you could never get even with the guy. He, he was good, but it didn't matter how many times you hit him, he's always ahead of you. The only yeah. way to outrun like, him was to stay away from him, wasn't it? Yeah. That's the only way you beat yeah. him is you had to get quicker than he was and re a lot quicker, too. I mean, you had to get where he just didn't get nowhere around you. I well, spent a lot of time He'd with get him. on that last lap and, boy, Ooh. he'd just put that, that bumper up right to you. He was the best I've ever seen it. You go. If he, he was, was close to you, you just ran second if you was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> that's the hard good. philosophy. You hit me once, I hit you twice. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the new Let math. Me, hey, that's it. That one. <laughs> On that one, let me tell you one what I saw at MIS one time. Kel, DW. <laughs> they really fighting. DW's leading. Kel's leading. DW. When it comes check a flag time, Kel's leading. Kel run on down into turn one and backed off. And here comes DW. He's run 4,000 miles an hour. I said, oh, hell. <laughs> Kale's going to get rear in. He's going to put it. Just as he got to him, Kale turned up the track. DW went down across, the, got in the mud. It had been raining. <laughs> about, he missed him. It had been raining about three or four. That was the day we started the race, like at 5.30 yeah, at night. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's the one. Yeah. It had been raining for three or four days. And DW so much water down there, he couldn't get out of the race car. I had to stay in the race car, they towed it out. <laughs> that was Junior's fault. <laughs> he came on the radio, and me and Kale, we were having a spirited battle. <laughs> and Junior came on the radio, and he said, Daryl, don't you let that little scoundrel beat you. <laughs> so, man, I'm up on that wheel hard as I can get up on that wheel. And Kale, he ran into me on the last lap oh, over yeah, in the third yeah, turn yeah. and bumped me up out of the way yeah, yeah. and won the race. And, of course, I had to you know, try to pursue after him. You know. <laughs> How'd it feel down that bog down in that boat? <laughs> you know, pretty hit. embarrassing. <laughs> Kale's hit a lot of people at Michigan. Oh, I'm he he's done, you. He's done that to me one time up he, there. Yeah, hit you, David. Every That's time I run How many people in here has Kale hit? Got you at Michigan one Mark, day. Huh? Mark, he hit me. me one day at Michigan. I was driving that K and K insurance Dodge Harry Hine. Kale kept hammering on me and hammering on me. We was running first and second, I believe, or second and third. And finally, I come on the radio. Mr. Croscroft was there that day, and I said, Harry, I said I want you to tell Nord that. I'm not crazy, but there's going to be a hell of a wreck out here if Kale hits me one more time. I don't mean to tear his car up, but I said, if he hits me one more time, I'm going to park him. So we go down in the first and second corner, and he leans on me a little bit lightly, and I'm going up the back straightaway. We go into three, and Kale comes down and hits me. Man, we come off that fourth turn, and I just drove right into him and turned him around. Round he went, round I went, down through the grass. It had rained. 
we was, I think, in the grass, on the racetrack, back in the grass, back on the racetrack, slid up in front of everybody backwards. Everybody missed us. We both got cranked up and got going again. I'm not sure if Cale ended up winning that race, but we both finished, I think, in the top two or three. Yeah. I believe he might have been driving your car, Junior, I'll at the time. Junior's I'm not car, sure. We won it, and I, I had hit you a time or two that day. But my car was handling so bad. You know, and, 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 and when you hit me, you straightened it out. Well, I was, and I was going, I appreciate that, Dave. Harry, Harry Hyde comes back on the radio, and Harry says, don't you let that son of a gun run over you. I don't want you to take no crap off of nobody. <laughs> He's kind of like Buddy's talking about Harry Gant this morning. You know, all of Harry's old cars just barely would run. Oh, they all were. Yeah. Run. Worst just running just cars. Just, just yeah. doggone this old yeah. car. This one hardly get out the pits, and we lucked up and won. You know, if, just, if Harry could have ever had a good carburetor, <laughs> he, ain't no telling how many races he'd have won. True, <laughs> but every race he won, old car was skipping bad, man. I asked him up here when I got up here, I said, didn't you? You win because we're going to run that Mark Colley thing. I said, Well, didn't you win that thing a couple times? He said, Yeah. He said, But them all them boys had good running cars. This old car I had, he said. <laughs> <laughs> he said, He was just telling me all about it, you know, and he said how they just caught him all at the end of the race, you know, and oh, they yeah. were just blowing up through there. Yeah. And he said, But just somehow, I don't know how they didn't get by me there them last <laughs> yeah. couple of laps, you know. He just happened to limp on home and win the race. I thought, Yeah. I'm Skipping and a that. duping. They yeah. dupe on him, too. I had one good carburetor. <laughs> I go over juniors one night. We were fixing to run the, the modified race at Char uh, Daytona on the Oval. You know, was, I think that's one of the first ones that's going to run on the Oval in a, in a long time. And so we built an old Firebird there in the garage. It didn't even have a trunk or anything held in, just open. Gas tank set right in the back. Didn't know anything about building no super speedway car. So. I go to Junior's one night to get some parts, and he's sitting there with them little glasses down on his nose, and he's got all these carburetors cut in half. And they're like that, you know, and I told him he was going down to Daytona. He looked at it and he said, how would you like to have about 15 more horsepower with a stricter plate? <laughs> <laughs> I said, that'd be good. So he gives me this carburetor. He said, this thing is built for a stricter plate. <laughs> I said, okay, so he gave me the carburetor and said, and don't lose it. <laughs> so we got a day told you know, and I got his carburetor on there, you know, and we're going to the racetrack and practice, and we pretty fast. And there was nothing wrong with the carburetor, it was just something nobody else didn't have. It didn't push the rule either way, and nobody Junior had it. He, oh, he'd been over there studying this stuff. He, Junior knew the restrictor plates were coming in down the road, so he was getting ahead of the game. Yeah. 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 See what you're made yeah. of. You can tell the truth, you're retired. <laughs> I thought I was going to lose that carburetor all the time I was down there. We went in the race. And uh, we had about a lap lead, front tire blistered, and it's shaking like crazy. And I didn't know what was wrong with the car. I never had to run no place like that. But, but then after the race was over, I was still scared I was going to lose. I couldn't enjoy the race. I couldn't enjoy winning because I'm sitting here thinking they're going to now it's a little bit. I'm going to lose this carburetor. I can't go back over to Wilkesburg without that carburetor. But that was a good one. <laughs> Talking about Kayle getting hit. Uh, you know more about it than I do, but the two Germans, you was in an IROC race up at Ohio, yeah. and uh, one of them hit you and spun you out or something, and, and you was arguing with one of them, and it was the wrong German you was arguing with. He, said, <laughs> he says, I didn't hit you up there, I hit you up at this other turn. <laughs> Started an international incident. Yeah, I, was, I was really on him hard, because you know, I didn't know one from the other, and I was on, on him hard when the race was over. And he was standing there, you know, he didn't know what I was talking about. Like say, I was telling him where he hit me. He How said, no, I didn't hit you there. I hit you back up in the, <laughs> in the other term when I was talking to the wrong man that had really hit me in it. How long did it take you two to get together and talk after 1979 at Daytona? One week. One week? Yeah, at Rockingham. In the truck. <laughs> in the <laughs> truck. They had to talk. <laughs> no, we didn't, we didn't have any truck meetings then. No, uh, uh We didn't have no truck meetings. Not either. back in those days. Uh, really? In fact, it was two seventy nine. Uh, no, it's been that long. In ago. fact, it was two weeks. <laughs> yeah, ago. I'm telling it you what. Ain't been fifteen years ago. It was no. two weeks. We got together two weeks later that, in Rockingham. We handled our own deals back then, and NASCAR didn't handle them for us. Well, all I know is I was in the truck in seventy nine. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you you've That's had a different story. story. You've had the week in seventy nine. You've had the pleasure a lot more than the rest of us combined of being in the truck. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. But we network. got together two weeks after that at Rockingham in the third and fourth turn. How'd you get it worked out? 
Well, the records came and got us. <laughs> <laughs> no, two That's weeks right, happened. it did at Rockingham. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, right. That was a, really an accident, though, wasn't it, Donnie? Yeah. Oh, yeah, all of them were accidents. <laughs> <laughs> all of them were accidents. Uh, <laughs> But it, was, uh, it wasn't good because a lot of other people got involved and it was, Kale and I were racing hard and one of them things happened. As far as getting together and uh, uh, being friends again, I don't know if that's ever happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, guys. Oh, I've seen this show. Don't do it. Hey, Donnie, Kale's getting red again. He's oh, yeah. <laughs> getting a little bright. And, and he's behind, too, right? Yeah. <laughs> he's behind you. Bobby's way over there. I was going to say, how about Bruiser over here? What was, your, uh, what was your drive. recollection of that whole deal? He'll drive up. Let me, let me tell well, you see, one on Bobby. Bobby was I, in hog heaven. He went to a race and a fight broke out. He was in hog heaven. I was going along, you know, I was, I was, I was ahead of them on the track. My, my crew came on the radio and said, uh, give them a lot of room. They're racing. I said, I will drive down in the grass if I have to. They never got to me. I looked back and they're wrecking. Well, I had to go around and get the checker flag. So I had to pass the wreckage once, went and got the checker flag. So I, Decided, well, I'll stop and give Donnie a ride. So what about I me? You want to go give me a ride? <laughs> you want, you did what? That's what I got mad about. You want to take Donnie and leave me there? I, I couldn't tell exactly what you were mad about, but I found out you were mad. So I stopped, and Kale's way over there, and Donnie's over here, and I said, want a ride? He said, no, nah, go on. I'll, I'll get a ride. Well, well, that Kale came running at me, hollering it was my fault that the wreck happened. <laughs> And, uh, and it you know, I, I couldn't understand this. I think I questioned his ancestry, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Well, he came running a little bit closer, you know, and he yelled at me some more, and I probably questioned his ancestry again. <clears throat> with that, he hit me in the face with his helmet. And I looked down in my lap, a couple of drops of blood hit down in my suit, and I said, I better get out of this thing and handle this right now or run from him the rest of my life. <laughs> so I crawled out of the car. With that, he went to beating on my fist with his nose. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, this thing's got clean out of hand. <laughs> if you need a good, tell it like it is. If you need a good attorney, I'll represent yeah. you. you was there, he, was, he was a little bit riled. I was sitting in my car when this thing started. Two of the greatest fiddling here, fidgeting with first place. Passing some of the strikes in the last lap. Trying to take it home. It's all come down to this. Out of turn two, Donnie Allison in first. Where will Kale make his move? He comes to the inside. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. He slides. Donnie Allison slides. They hit again. They climb into the turn. They're hitting the wall. They're head on the wall. They slide down to the inside. Let's watch those third place cars. They're out of it. Who is going to win it? Coming down. Third place. They're coming around for the finish. Between A.J. Point and Richard Petty. Down the back straightaway come the leaders now. Two cars are out in the back stretch are the leaders. Watching for the leaders to They're still up in turns three and four. The leaders are up in turns three and four. Coming down, Richard Petty is now. career and, and there's a fight between Kale Yarborough and Donnie Allison. The Teppers overflowing. They're angry. They know they have lost. And what a bitter defeat. A couple of very hard men, very hardly upset. And Bobby Allison is stopped by his brother to help. There's Bobby Allison's car, number 15. They're leading them away. Darrell, Kale Yarborough there. Very upset. Very upset. And that one incident, you can still turn the TV on and see that incident that, that really excited the people and made the people come buy a ticket for the next week. It was one of the first and races that the guys... excited the press, because we were yeah. up in the press box, Tom and I were sitting next to each other, and I was literally on my feet balancing myself between two rows of desks like this, and I was standing up 
trying Howard to catch hit him. Hit him. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no. He was yelling, Richard's going to win the race. Watch Richard's the finish. Richard's going to win the Watch race. Watch the finish. I Tom said, says. yeah, I know that. I want to see the fight. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind that. There'll be a hell of a fist fight in the third turn. And sure enough, we heard Ken's voice come on in. And there's a fight in the third turn. We looked, you know, you couldn't see it, but yeah. we saw images of, uh, of it on the television uh, screen that they had in there, and it looked more like a dance than a fight at the time. I mean, why has guy got one leg up? <laughs> you know, that's why we've all been around all these years, Barn. We've had no lack of stuff to talk about, have we? Well, well let me tell you what. Uh, the one guy that really added to that the most is sitting right in front of me. Because the TV cameras, they did a good job of TV in that race, being the first live race, but nothing like it is now. And what the people saw was two cars wrecking across the lake and he did the job mm -hmm. yep. his commentary is what got the people going including the news media and everything else and you did a good job ken i'm not blaming you for anything uh we were oh, over yeah. there. we need another deal like that now absolutely it's coming it's yeah. coming <laughs> where do you think it's where Oh, well, I want to be there. Shortly, I think. Probably in the next two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we <laughs> the only thing that I disagree with that, it's not coming in that same way because you're not going to have two cars racing each other like those two cars are racing yeah. each other. Now no, I might now, be... Now, now the drivers I'm, accost each other. Now I might be... <laughs> and I even yeah. saw them throw Perrier bottles at each oh, other. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it's, it may never be the same as it was. We need to talk about that. Now you got all these high cotton racetracks with all these amenities. I think we ought to go back to what it was like some of those first tracks you drove on. I can't believe all of this tribe can sit here without some great stories about those early super speedway races. Higgins? Well, I was right, one of the I wanted Buddy to tell about his crash at, uh, I think it was Smoky Mountain Speedway. Yeah. Yeah. Don Neyman's place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great, great story. Uh, that thing's been in every newspaper and, and just about everything, but it actually happened. I blew a right front tire at the old Smoky Mountain Raceway, went head on into the wall, and I broke about four or five ribs on the right-hand <coughs> side there. And they sent a guy out there about the size of, uh, well, about 145 <laughs> pounds to get hold of me, and I weighed 225 pounds then. And First off, he, he got me by the head and tried to take me out of the car. <laughs> and then uh, they brought this little gurney out there with these little small wheels on them, and the thing was six foot tall, and they had an old Pontiac ambulance there. And this guy finally gets some help, and they get me on there. Well, they put the straps on me, and they carry me over this old Pontiac. I can still remember seeing that. <laughs> That Indian, on, it looked like his own fire, had that big red face on it there. <laughs> and I'm going, man, I'm hurt. I'm really hurt. And they put me up in the back of that thing, and here goes this ambulance. Wadding round the corner, and I go, golly, I don't think I run this fast tonight. So <laughs> down to the back straightaway, stops like so. And they have to open the gate, and you have to leave from the back straightaway. Well, I'm laying there like this, and I'm going, oh, man. And about that time, this guy hit the accelerator, the back door flew open. They didn't tighten the wheels up on the thing. I shoot out in front. They hadn't put a red flag out, so people are coming out of the pit. And I'm going round and round down the racetrack like that. And I see these cars going boom, boom, boom on both sides. And I went, I got to do something. I got to do something. And I got one arm out of the straps like that, and I start doing like that. Well, I went down, hit in the red mud on the inside of the racetrack, and this gurney goes end over end down there. And the little guy come up there and he said, are you hurt? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm dead. All you gotta do is just cover me up here. Well, we went on in and, and that was the first time I had anything to do with Don Naiman. <laughs> he had later on become the president of Talladega Motor Speedway. And, uh, that's funny. I, I'm telling you, I thought I was going to die right there. If I hadn't got my arm out, I know Joe Frazan would hit me head on. Because he was coming right down the back straightaway, and I got my arm out and started doing that, and that got his attention. He said he didn't know what it was. He thought it was a hood going down there. Remember the day you broadcast from the bathroom? Remember that story? Yeah. That, I was uh, working the pits for MRN, and I needed to go to the bathroom. Of course, we know 
back then the, the restroom was right up on the front stretch, heck, just 20 or 30 <laughs> feet behind the pits. And uh, Barney, I guess, was, said, let's go to the pits. And Ned Jarrett and uh, Richard Petty was about to come in and make a pit stop. And he's leading the race. And there I was standing in there doing my business. And uh, <laughs> Barney threw it down to me. And I had a stopwatch around my neck. And I heard the car come to a halt. And I, I looked at that thing. I described the pit stop. They changed the two tires, putting in a can of fuel, and down and away in 17 seconds. You could hear it all, you know. So I didn't need to see what was going on. And come to find out, I called it just perfect. Yeah. Probably <laughs> never been looking at it. The guys next to you, though, they were the ones who were giving the great looks there in the bathroom, three guys standing right next to Ned. You were luckier than I was because when Richard had his big turnover at Daytona, that was one of those races where it had stabilized, not much was happening, and it was when they were building the brand new facility at Daytona, and the only restrooms were all the way on the roof. Remember that, Eli? Mm -hmm. They had them all the way on top. And I guess I'd had too much coffee that morning. And so it was, what, 150, 175 miles into the race. And uh, things were just kind of motoring along. And I said to Bob Stenner, the producer, uh, can I take a break for just a couple of minutes? He said, well, we're going to go to a commercial break. And I have this feature to do about Dale Earnhardt, which is going to take another three minutes. So you got five minutes. Don't worry about a thing. Went to the commercial break, ran out, ran upstairs. And as I was standing there, it began to get suddenly very quiet. And the next thing, this very young lady was standing at the door saying, you've got to come now. And I said, well, I, I really can't right now. She said, no, you've got. And that's when we found out about the disaster. And uh, Ned and Economaki carried on. But talk about life's darkest moment. That was it for me. Scary time. What about some of those other stories about the old track? Junie Donlevy has got a great story about going to the restroom. The restroom? Yeah. Yeah, tell us well, that one, Junie, the about the rest <laughs> stop. <laughs> and, uh, How about the rest stop? The rest the stop on the way to Atlanta, Junie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how much your team thought of you that night? <laughs> I really found out how much they thought of me. We were, <laughs> we were on our way to Atlanta and uh, riding in a van and pulling this rest area at Durham. And, Two guys up front went on in. There was only four of us in the van. And they went on in, and I'm laying there, and I said, well, maybe I'd better go in, too, so we don't have to stop again. So I stepped on a boy getting out that was laying on the floor. I went on in, only had three stalls, went by them, thought, sure, they saw me, and I didn't make any noise. And they finished, washed hands, went on out. I finished, washed my hands, went on out, and I saw the taillights of the car going out the driveway. And I said, they, they got to be playing a trick on me. You know, we in the middle of the night, and we're on the way to Atlanta. So I waited uh, about 15, 20 minutes, and I said, well, they're not going to come back and get me. But at that time, I got to see in face it's coming out behind all these trees and everything, and it had a big audience there, I thought. Anyway, I waited till the tractor and trailer pulled up, and I went over when he stopped, and I started talking. Never paid any attention to me, just like I wasn't even there, which I could understand. I hear I'm on foot at a restaurant in the middle of the night. <laughs> but I kept talking, and finally I went all the way back to my childhood, where I'd gone <laughs> to grade school, where my grandfather lived. And the only thing that saved me, when my grandfather died, they sold the property that he had his farm on, and they built houses on it. And this truck driver happened to live in one of those houses. That, wow. <laughs> and I mean, I had to go that. It took me about 45 minutes before I got him to realize what had happened. Anyway, he took me on into Concord, and he had flat tire, and he had needed to get fixed, so I called Elmo. Explained everything to Elmo to Gail, and she told Elmo, and then the phone hung up. I dialed it back and I said, ma'am, let me tell you something. You tell Elmo if he hangs this damn phone up my face one more time, I'm going to come up and blow his trail off his foundation. <laughs> anyway, I finally got him to realize that I wasn't kidding and he came on down and picked me up and took me back and he was just laughing like, you know, it was a funny deal. It wasn't that funny to me. <laughs> but anyway, he took me on into Atlanta. And I got to the track, my crew came up, and uh, this boy said, uh, you know, we know your side of the story, now I'm gonna tell you my side of it. And I said, don't worry about it, my fault. 
But that evening, I think Dick Beatty announced on the loudspeaker, make sure Don Levis got a ride back to the motel. <laughs> but you know, it was so funny, that was the only weekend I can ever remember that everybody at the racetrack was having a good time. Of course, it was at my expense, but everybody was <laughs> laughing and grinning and... and Talking really, about you. Well, I knew that they were, they won't, you know, but I, I wish that racing could be like that all the time because I've oh, never can. seen Just a get group. out of the truck more often. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd work again, but I, everybody was just at ease and having a good time. And it was really a, a very jolly weekend. But has it changed? Has it really changed? It seems to a lot of us that it isn't as much fun as it used to be, and maybe it's well, just because we're older. Let, let me tell you what the difference is. Back then, uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, David, myself, Kale, Bobby, we'd go out and eat dinner or something, or we'd go somewhere together, you know, and Buddy, once in a while we sneak him in there, and <laughs> they don't do that anymore. Uh, it's so individual now, they, they, the drivers, they got so many obligations, and uh, whether it be with sponsors or whatever it is, and, and there's no, none of that palling around at all. Now we race each other, race hard as you could race, but at least we were better friends, I feel like, than most of the guys are now. And you know, Darrell come along and, and he messed up everything. <laughs> well, I did no, not. <laughs> no, he had a he had a hard time. Uh, he had a hard time uh, really making friends because I was just a lot younger than these guys, and it was hard for me to fit in. Now, before, you, before you drift too far, I want Leonard Woods to tell a story about the time he's going down the interstate and he hears this race car coming. Exactly what I was going to say, buddy. <laughs> that you got to tell, funny... tell that story, Leonard. You mean about the uh, hitchhiker? Got, yeah. Um, it was uh, was coming home from Riverside in 1965, and Gurney had won, and Marvin had finished third, I believe. And uh, it was in, Marvin's car was on the back of this trailer. We had a little ton truck, you know, that we, uh, pulled the trailer, and then the car was on the back of the trailer, just open. So we, it was Ray, my brother Ray, and I stopped in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, at a truck stop, and we came out, got in the truck. And these people were standing around, you know how normally people's going to stand around and look at a race car, you know, so we didn't think nothing about it. We got in the truck and leave. And that was January. It was cold, too, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 20 degrees. <laughs> and it was at night, and uh, we get between uh, Greenville and Charlotte, and the truck begins vibrating, you know, and, and uh, so I'm wondering what it is, and the race says, well, you can't even feel it in the truck. And... Uh, so I rolled down the glass, look around, see if it's the airport nearby, you know, making all this noise. And so then it quit. And then we got up and yelled to Charlotte, and we had to stop in Charlotte for a minute. Meanwhile, we passed Glenn on the way. He's in the station wagon, but he don't recognize this. But as we get ready to, uh, to turn off the exit in Charlotte, it started up again. So I opened the door and looked out, and there was steam coming out the exhaust pipe. So uh, I told Ray, I said, stop this thing. And I get out and go around, and I see this uh, silhouette behind the windshield. It's a figure of a man or something back behind this windshield. And I look in there, and he's got Marvin's helmet on. <laughs> and I says, what do you think you're doing in there? He says, let's go. I says, <laughs> I says, I'll let you go in a minute. About that time, Ray come around the corner. So we getting with him pretty heavy, you know, jerking him out of the car. He's a screaming and hollering. We're about to break his leg. And uh, we turn him loose. He just got comfortable again. So finally, we get him out. We're sitting there talking to him. He says, you ever heard of Larry Frank? You know, we used to race with Larry Frank for years, you know. We said, never heard of him. He says, I'll tell you one thing. Y'all got a long ways to go then. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> about that time the the law came by and they took care of me, you know. But uh, he cut my clothes bag open. I guess he's looking for clothes because it's 20 degrees. Didn't he want to know where the heater switch was on there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't you have your car pass yourself on the highway one day? Yeah, one it, night. One night? Yeah, we used to race at uh, Chinese Corner. Uh, out Virginia Beach every Tuesday night, and uh, Bud Allman was the crew chief, and and we pulled it behind. He had a 55 Ford, and this was in uh, 55 or 56, and we were coming back up the road about two or three o'clock in the morning, and I was laying in the back seat, sort of dozing off, and Bud was 
running about 90 miles an hour on this country road. There were no interstates back then. And all of a sudden, I felt the, the back end of the tow car wiggle a little bit, and it woke me up. And I sat up, and I looked over to my left, and here come that 37 Ford right up beside of us. And what had happened, see, we had those man-made tow bars, and you stick a rod through the, the end of the frame and the tow hitch, and then you put a carter key in there to, to hold it. Well, somebody forgot to put the carter key in there and, and uh, secure the thing, and we'd probably would come 150 miles since we had left the racetrack, but it just finally worked itself loose, and that rod came out, and here come that 37 Ford right up beside of us. Well, it ran up a, a you know, they're set up to pull to the left, and so it just gradually pulled to the left, and, and it went up a bank that was sloped, and uh, it had enough speed and momentum when it went up that bank, it cleared a barbed wire fence. And we could see that thing, we just had one little tail light on the back of it, and we could see that thing going down through the field, look like a rabbit <laughs> tail, you know, going down through the field. It got right down to a creek and it stopped. It must have been a quarter of a mile down through there. So we went down and got it, and of course we pulled one axle out so we could tow it. And uh, so fired the thing up, got back up there, and. Didn't think about it until I got back to the fence. How are we going to get that thing back across there? Wasn't no bank that you could get a run. Don't know if I'd have done that anyway, you know, but, but it, that barbed wire fence was still intact. And I told Bud, I said, well, stand back. We've got to go through it. That's all we can do. And so I just ran her through that barbed wire fence and, <laughs> and uh, got on. The, we saw lights start coming on in the farmhouses around there. Fortunately, we were out in the country and those lights started coming on. I said, we better get out of here because we're fixing to get ourselves in trouble. But, uh, the tow end was all bent and the wheels were going one way and another and we drug it about 20 miles into a little town and uh, so we could be able to get it fixed and blew a tire out right as we got in the edge of town on the front because the thing was towed out so much. But uh, can you imagine if that had been in heavy traffic and that thing <laughs> would have come loose like that? You, know, you talk about, you talk about uh, a race car passing somebody on the road. I remember yeah. back in the early 50s and Banjo Matthews had a Rocket 88 Oldsmobile engine in a 36 coupe. We was running West Palm Beach, Florida on a half mile dirt at that time. And somewhere about uh, 25 or 30 miles below West Palm Beach, uh, their tow truck broke down. And they was running late as it was, they was already qualifying and they knew it. He backed that car off of the trailer, fired it up, and come up that little old two lane road coming up to the West Palm Beach Speedway. And he had the thing rolling, I guess, 100, 120 mile an hour bouncing up and down that road and past the highway patrol going the other way and that highway patrol, all I could see was the yellow and black car go whew, going the other way. <laughs> well, he turned around trying to make a U-turn as quick as he could to try to catch the car. Banjo come flying into the pits, went straight through the, the infield was in the, inside the racetrack. Come through the pit gate, pulled right up in line. He was next in line to qualify, and he was out on the racetrack qualifying. That <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't sure which one it was, and he's standing in that pit 20 minutes trying to figure out which car he <laughs> was. <laughs> Guys, we need to take a quick break here so they can uh, uh, rack in some new tape. So uh, let's just right. take a quick breather here for a few minutes. Uh, have you changed jobs again? No. I'm no, I know, but I'm helping Jimmy. Jimmy. Yeah. I'll help Thank Jimmy. You. I told him I'm working this time. He's gonna run Talladega? Yeah, he's gonna run Talladega. Yeah, I don't think their motor's that. He's got a hammer motor motor that's supposed to freshen up. He didn't get up and check the valve for intention and put it back in the car, so I don't know. We tested down there, you know, top enough to be top five, but I don't know what he's, gonna, what he's got some of the other cars to show up. But we, we tested down about two weeks ago, ran pretty decent. Got to qualify Thursday, so after we get this deal done Wednesday night, I got to take off and go straight back. Mm -hmm be down there for Thursday morning. Got one practice session to qualify Thursday. I didn't know if you were, I didn't, in fact, I didn't even know if he was still uh, still running or, or what. Uh, yeah. You know, the, He's uh, been short sponsorship, but he got some Dunlap golf money for this Talladega race. He's gonna run this one, and I think Las Vegas, that's only two races going on this year. We ran Charlotte, ran 12. Uh, run pretty decent with it, but had a Pick up pit crew. You know, had one Barley Jack man here, Barley Tire man well, here, yeah, Tire man here. Yeah, we come. We were running eighth, going into pits, come out fifteenth, and he got back up to tenth, and then picked up a push about the last ten laps of the race, and two cars got by him, and we finished twelfth. Yeah, see, that's like the picked up truck deal now. They they go ahead and pit stop for that. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, now what, you can't and, and you can't compete against money. The, the factory team with a pickup pit crew. I mean, the guys are good guys. I mean, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I told them, I said, but they don't work don't, together. I mean, don't misunderstand me. Yeah. It's not anything wrong with the guys. 
but when when you've got pit crews that, that the crew chief says 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning we're gonna have a practice they go out and practice Wednesday morning they don't like what they see they come back that afternoon at two o'clock and do it all over again yeah, yeah. and I mean how in the heck yeah. can you how can you compete against that well that, that's what I thought was up in Charlotte last week and we had a Jack man from one team, a front tire man from the one man, a front man, and he had a bar to gas man. We, and they, nobody ever worked together, and they even made a practice pit stop. So, you know, we, we goofed and lost about six spots in the pit. But, you know, I see where NASCAR, I read an article the other day that a lot of the independent teams compared was complaining about paid pit crews that only come in on race day and work on the cars. That they're not regular crew members that work for that team all week long. That, like they said, like for instance, I think they said Jeff Gordon that about 75% of the team only show up just for race day to pit the car. They're not guys that work on the car during the week for the team. They're outside yeah, of professional no, health. Well, they, and they said they, that's a lot of guys complaining. They'd like to see everybody that makes a pit stop be on the team payroll to work full time for the team. But I don't well, know. How are you going to do that? I don't know. I mean, how they, would you ever do that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that's another. That's another argument that, that yeah. it's day old. Uh, oh, well, he got more money to spend than I got. Well, you yeah. got to take, you gotta take what you got and do the best with it anyway, right? Yeah. All they got to do is put them on a the payroll. Uh, yeah. And I mean, that, that's... Uh, yeah. yeah, there's always going to be some kind of complaint about it. Well, but. it's been since day one. But why did they do that with the pickup truck? They had a pretty good deal with the tire rule. I have no idea. They're really not going to make the stop at halfway and anymore for... I, I ain't got any idea because I went to Dennis Hooth and I told him, I said, Dennis, now, the problem you've caused us, the problem you've caused us is now we've got to have eight full-time employees instead of four. Because a nucleus of our pit crew yeah. has to work for us. Yeah. Because on Thursday or Tuesday, if we call a pit crew practice, we can't say, oh no, well John works at the Walmart, he won't yeah. get off at five o'clock tonight. Yeah. You understand what I mean? Yeah. And, and if he'd be a tire changer or a jack man or a gas man, I mean, you got to have those people there. What about there. the tire rule? You want to have a tire rule where you only got to sit on so well, many tires? I, I'm, I'm sure they're going to probably regulate it some way like that, Red. But it, it gets back into the same thing. Yeah. I mean, what are you, what are you going to say? Yeah. What, what can you say? Yeah. i got to go see my buddy. A few weeks after taping these videos, Dick Beatty passed away. We dedicate these videos to his memory.